I want to give you all an update, kind of um, overview of the Big First District. Let you know what we've um, what we've done, what we're working on. Then happy to answer any questions. Um, hear what's going on here uh, in, in Ellsworth County. So can you all hear me okay back there? Kind of weird that I feel like I'm kind of talking behind these um, chairs here, but um, but that'll work. So this is an overview of the district, and and I found this map uh, to be helpful. So you know this is Kansas. We have four congressional districts. Our district, I won the lottery because I get to represent the uh, the best district in the country, uh, the, the the big first. We are, believe it or not, um, of 435 congressional districts, we're the 11th largest. Um, we're the fifth largest that's not its own state. So South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, some some states uh, are their own congressional district, but we are a very large district. Um, our district is larger, is about the same size as the state of Illinois. So Illinois is just a tiny bit larger than, than our district. Um, our district of 435 districts in the country um, is the number three ag producing district in the country. So there's only 10 congressional districts that, that do more than $10 billion of ag production a year. Last year we did $12.5 billion of, of ag production. We are number one in the whole country for beef production. Uh, we're number one for wheat production, number one for uh, sorghum or milo production number seven for corn and I think number 11 for dairy. So, you know, we have oil and gas, we have other industries as well, but as we all know, um, so much of our economy revolves around agriculture. Uh, we also have more um, hospitals in the big first than any district in the country and more critical access hospitals. So healthcare, access to healthcare, rural healthcare, really important issue um, for me and, and I know for a lot of citizens all over, um, all over the district. So i uh, been really busy few months. Uh, we kind of, these boards up here, kind of what we've done. Um, we got our district offices open. So, uh, we, of course, we have an office in D.C. We also have an office in the district in Manhattan and one in Dodge City. So uh, if you have any needs, feel free to, um, of course, call or stop by any of our offices. One of the things our offices do um, here in the district is we do a lot of what's called casework. So if you or anyone you know is having issues interfacing with the federal government, maybe that means um, issue with uh, um, some paperwork on a farm program payment or uh, with a passport or with immigration services, the IRS, whatever. Um, I can't promise we can always move mountains, but many times we can work and get a response or a call back or get in touch with the person that sometimes can help resolve issues. So, so far, uh, our, our team has helped about 400. We've opened about 400 cases so far this year. So that's a lot of what we do. So keep that in mind um, and, and reach out any, any time. So I uh, brought with me um, Reed Petty back in the corner. So Reed is our district director. Um, Reed left his house in Manhattan yesterday morning at 530. He picked me up in Salina at 630. And we have been all over um, Northwest Kansas and, and having a great time. We also have Emily who uh, is from Kansas and she's in our DC office. So Emily's um, back uh, around as well. So feel free to, uh, to say hi to uh, um, Reed and Emily. Uh, so much of what happens in Congress, there's 435 members of Congress, so it's a big body. A lot of what happens because the body's so big happens at the committee level, which means that committee assignments are really important. So uh, my committee is, I'm on the House Ag Committee, which was my number one priority by far. Um, and you, know, you get elected to Congress and realize everything's a competition. So there were 20 freshmen vying for six spots, so really glad to get on the House Ag Committee. Uh, and then my other committee assignment is the Veterans Affairs Committee. And I just think if we're not caring for our veterans, doing right by uh, the men and women that, that have fought and served our country, you know, what are we doing as a nation? Do we have, can you raise your, are we have any veterans that are here in the room? Yeah. Well, th thank you all very, very much for your service. Thank you. we, we are very, very, very grateful. So, um, so far this year, I think I've authored uh, 14 pieces of legislation. Uh, co-sponsor uh, 127, 130 different bills, casted a few hundred votes, been very busy and active legislatively. Um, quick background, I grew up on a farm in Quinter, so that's where my um, folks uh, still live. My dad and brother farm together. Um, Audrey, my wife and I, we live in Salina, and, uh, and I went to K-State, and we live in Salina, have four little kids. So our kids are um, 10 down to three. So it's been, as you can imagine, pretty a big adjustment for our family uh, this year. And our, our house is pretty crazy. Um, so we decided for whatever reason, the start of the summer, um, kids are from school, we got a puppy and we got three kittens. So we kind of added that to the mix. And um, the other day, or a couple days ago, I walked into our garage, we have a fridge in our garage, and my son, who's seven, he goes, Dad, good news. He goes, I got the cat out of the refrigerator. And I thought, I guess that's good news. So my three-year-old had put our, her kitten in the refrigerator. Um, it was cold, but it was still alive, and, uh, and it was just fine, so you never know. Uh, what you're going to see. Early, earlier this year, 
Um, you know, with COVID lighting up, we had a, uh, we took our kids to kind of the first big dinner, if you will. So we were in Manhattan. Um, kids got dressed up. You know, they did a good job. We we're trying to figure out how to do events as a family. But um, afterwards, so I have three daughters and one son. And afterwards, we we're going to leave Manhattan and uh, drive home to Salina. And my son Austin needed to go to the bathroom. And so I took him into the uh, bathroom, and it was one of those motion-activated sinks, uh, you know, and he couldn't reach. You know, kids can't reach. The, so he asked if I could help him. I said, sure. And so I'm standing over him, and I'm doing the, you know, the sink, and he's, like, washing his hands. Um, and out of the blue, he looks up. He goes, Dad, he goes, I've got butter in my pocket. And I thought, well, that's odd. And so I reached into his pocket. And you know those little aluminum foil-covered butters? So I pulled a butter out of his pocket um, and another butter, and another butter. He had 13 butters uh, in his pocket, and he had nine butters in this pocket. I mean, he, he had more butters than I could hold in both hands, and uh, and he was he was getting hot, right? And so the butter started to get soft, and we're about getting getting ready to get in the car for an hour. And uh, my last name's Man, so I call him Little Man. I say, Hey, Little Man, kind of, what's the plan here? This is not going to end well. Uh, and I could tell there really wasn't a plan, and it was not going to end well. Um, and, and, but I would say I, I feel like that's similar to what we're seeing in Washington, D.C. right now. There actually is a plan, but a lot of things we're seeing happening, a lot of policies that are being passed, I think, are not going to end well and are not going to be good for uh, Kansas and, and the big first. Um, the, the political update would be, and I think most people know this, you know, as a country, we are very divided right now. Very divided. And then, of course, that's reflected um, in, in our government. So last fall's election in November, uh, Democrats picked up a couple of seats in the Senate, which means today, you know, there's 100 senators and we have 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats in the Senate. So that could not be, you know, that's just jammed up as tight as could be. Um, in the House where I serve, 435 members um, going into last fall's election. Most people said uh, everyone thought the Republicans would lose 20, 25 seats. Actually, Republicans gained 15 seats. Um, some crazy stats. So of the, the 28 closest races around the country, the 28 closest congressional races, uh, Republicans won 27 of 28 races. Um, not a single House Republican um, incumbent lost. So we actually saw the House, we saw, we saw the Senate shift to the left a little bit. We saw the House shift to the right, um, which means on January 3rd, uh, when I got sworn in, Nancy Pelosi is still the speaker. Uh, because Democrats still control um, or the majority in the House, but she was only the speaker by seven votes. Um, today, that margin is three. And that's because when you have 435 members, there's always some churn, and you have a host of Democrat congressmen and women that got appointed to the Biden administration, and those seats aren't fold yet. So again, 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats in the Senate, in the House, 435 members, it's a three-vote margin. Um, so you would have thought, uh, knowing that, going into how close it is, um, going into this uh, legislative session that, that the Democrat leadership in the House would potentially moderate or move to the middle to sort of protect their more vulnerable members. Uh, but we actually have seen the exact opposite, where we've seen them uh, make a hard left turn and really jam through a lot of policies uh, that, that I've opposed and I think the overwhelming number of folks in the big first um, would, would, would oppose as well. Um, things like H.R. 1 which would uh, federalize our elections. You know, we don't, Ellsworth does not need Washington, D.C. to tell you all how to run an election. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's passed. Um, there's been uh, bills that would defund the police and do away with qualified immunity. Um, that passed. All these things I strongly oppose, by the way, and these things have passed very slim margins, but they passed all the same. Uh, there's been legislation that would decrease our Second Amendment rights. Um, there was legislation one week a few months ago that would make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. Um, makes no sense, you know, Washington, D.C. is one seventeenth the size of Rhode Island. Uh, so it makes no sense to, to make Washington, D.C. Its, its own state. But so there's been a lot of things, a lot of things in the news that have passed the House. Um, those things, although, are log jam in the Senate because there's, you know, it's 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats in the Senate. But practically speaking, because of the Senate's filibuster rules, it takes 60 votes to get almost anything done in the Senate today, not just 50. And those things um, would have 48 to, to 50 votes, um, but they don't have 60, and, and so that's where a lot of things sit. So if the Senate filibuster rules were to change, uh, then a lot of things that have passed the House would also get through the Senate, and President Biden's already signaled that, that, that he would sign a lot of those things. Um, the reason the Senate filibuster rules uh, aren't changing is because the most conservative Democrat in the Senate is a guy from West Virginia named Joe Manchin, and a lot of people now heard of Joe Manchin, and, and he's not willing to change the filibuster rules, 
And so without his consent, without 50 senators wanting to, uh, to, to consent to that, the, the filibuster stays in place. So um, I would contend to you that the most powerful person in Washington, D.C. today's first name is Joe, uh, but it's not Joe Biden, it's Joe Manchin, because he's the one that really kind of has the keys to the car, um, so to speak. And, uh, and, and that's a good thing, uh, in, in, in my view, for, for us and, and for the big first. Now, I think to understand Joe Manchin, you got to realize that um, you know, he's a senator, very moderate uh, senator from uh, West Virginia. <coughs> Trump last fall, Trump won Kansas <coughs> by 14 points, so we're considered a very Trump state. Um, Trump won West Virginia, Joe Manchin's, um, his state, Trump won West Virginia by 38 points, um, which means that if you're Joe Manchin, you want to get reelected, I think he, he, and he does, he knows he can't go along um, with these big changes because he probably won't get reelected. So we, we will see how all that shakes out. Now, the one significant change, the one significant thing that has passed both the House and the Senate and got signed by um, President Biden was earlier this year, the American Rescue Plan. Um, $1.9 trillion, uh, the biggest spending bill in the history of the country. i um, strongly opposed to that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, met a lot of people here. I, for one, uh, came to hear them as much as you. You've already used up 15 minutes of an hour. Sure. Uh, I would like to hear the comments and questions from the audience. I personally have many. Okay. Uh, would you mind yielding the floor to the Sure. Typically, I usually all my other 45 of these, I give enough people like to kind of an update on kind of what's going on, then I'm happy to, uh, to, to answer some questions. Sure. Sure. You had 15 minutes. We've got a lot of people here. One person got 15. We got about 45. Yeah. No, fair here. enough. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll wrap up and say, so the American Rescue Plan passed $1.9 trillion. I'm concerned with the amount of money we're spending. You know, we are approaching $30 trillion in debt. We added $6 trillion uh, to, in debt last year alone. And if all of the the proposals that are on the table would pass that add another six trillion dollars. So at that point, we'd be thirty-six trillion dollars uh, in, in debt. So, so yeah, happy to uh, answer any questions and uh, stick around after as Would you like to go? As I give some questions, so feel free to go first if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I would like to. Great. Uh, I uh, have been paying fairly close attention to your voting record uh, using uh, the House website and Congress.gov. And there's quite a few votes that uh, I'd like to call attention to, and maybe sure. some of these people here are interested. Uh, you voted over, overturn the electoral vote. Uh, you voted against a, a relief bill for uh, public health, state, and local governments, individuals, and businesses. You voted to reduce. Uh, you voted against a bill that would reduce big money in politics and expand access to the ballot, encouraging voting. Uh, you voted against employee rights to organize and bargain collectively in the workplace. Uh, you voted against background checks for firearms. A lot of gun owners are for background checks for firearms. You voted against the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, which would protect them against domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, stalking. Uh, you voted against a bill that would provide uh, additional protections against child abuse. You, uh, you voted against the DREAM Act. We got, I think, if I recall right, about 5,000 DACA uh, young people in this state that would like to stay here. Uh, you voted against Medicare additional relief, Medicaid, and, uh, uh, Medicaid, Medicare additional relief for COVID, that sort of thing. Uh, you voted for, no, excuse me, you voted to condemn a military coup in Burma, but you won't vote to condemn the insurrection on our nation's capital. Uh, you, uh, let's see, the, Par the Paycheck Fairness Act uh, to provide a, a paycheck fairness for employees. You voted against that. Uh, you voted against requiring employers to take protections and provide workers a safe workplace. Uh, you voted against providing legal counsel to uh, U.S. nationals, permanent residents, aliens in possession of a visa returning asylees and refugees, and that's one of the fundamental principles of our Constitution, is right to counsel. Uh, you voted against prohibiting a debt collector from representing a service member that uh, the failure to cooperate with a debt collector will result in reduction of his rank or similar action, and you claim to be uh, supportive of veterans. That's, a, that's a, a piece of action that's very much against veterans' interest. Uh, you voted against reasonable accommodations for qualified employees affected by pregnancy. Uh, you voted against the passage of the COVID-19 hate, hate Crimes Act. Uh, 
147 Republicans voted for this one, but you voted against it. You voted against the uh, National Convention. Con Jeez. You voted against the National Commission to investigate the January 6th attack. You voted against protecting older workers against discrimination. You voted, uh, I'll, I'll skip that one. You, let's see. Is that a question of some sort? Yeah, is there a question? No. Yeah. 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 So I'll be very clear. So I was very, There's when a I question was, in there. Why all those no votes? We appreciate you being here. I don't know who this gentleman is. Okay, fair enough. You've got the floor. Yeah, Go okay. For it. No, I appreciate it. And I'll be very clear. You know, I ran for Congress. I was very clear. I'm, running, I'm advocating for agriculture and our conservative Kansas values. And uh, the descriptions you just read were very misleading. I'm happy to talk through any of those votes if you would like. But yeah, ma'am, question. I have a statement that I'd like to read to you. It's very brief. Sure. And um, I want to say in 1983, our legislators passed WEP, Windfall Elimination Provision. 3% of Social Security beneficiaries are not getting their earned benefits. In, in the 116th Congress, the WEP repeal bill, H.R. 141, had 264 co-sponsors. 202 were Democrats, 62 were Republicans. In the 116th Senate, Senate Bill S521 had 38 co-sponsors. 31 were Democrats. Five were Republicans and two were independents. In the 117th Congress, the WEP repeal bill, H.R. 82, has 208 co-sponsors. 156 are Democrats and 52 are Republicans. Senate Companion Bills, S. 1302, with 33 co-sponsors, 27 are Dems, and four are Republicans and two are independents. December of 2020, the Social Security reported 1.9 million, or 3%, are being discriminated against, treated differently than other retirees. We are very disappointed by the lack of support by Republicans to repeal this unfair rule of law that has been going on since 1983. First responders, law enforcement, teachers, and others are having their Social Security benefits stolen from them simply because they have a pension and they still qualify for Social Security. People that live in 27 countries that have worked in the United States and another country, if they don't have 30 years of substantial income, they can have their Social Security benefits reduced in both countries by 50%, which is forcing many of our friends and family members to work into their 70s and into their 80s. I want to be a true Republican, but this issue, and we've had president after president after president promising to repeal the web. When are we gonna get fairness? If you read the Social Security website statements, Social Security says that what WEP has is unintended consequences. Those unintended consequences are punishing people and, and saying that we are double dipping. <coughs> we're not double dipping, we're double working. I'd, be, I'd love to get, the, if you don't mind afterwards, I'd love to find that bill number and we can sure look at it and see can if it's something we can. This? Please do, yeah, I would love that, thank you. Yeah, we'll look into that and then I'll five close ones. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And the bill number's on there. Thank you. Okay. Please look sure. At this seriously. Yeah. It's okay. gone on for too long. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jim Kirkbride. I'm the new CEO of uh, Ellsworth County Memorial or Med Medical Center. Great. Excuse me. You said two things I'm very pleased to hear. One, you support our veterans. We have plenty of military inst installations here in Kansas. Uh, my father and mother met at Fort Riley, so it's really dear to me. And the second is critical access hospitals. One, I'd like to know what what you are doing or you think we should be doing for our critical access hospitals. And two, I'd like to volunteer to be on any kind of panel or discussion that you have in the near future about that. Great. I would, lo would love that. And are you part of the Kansas Hospital Association? I yes, know sir. We, they were in my office two weeks, three weeks ago, talking about a lot of these issues. I mean, I think one of the biggest things for hospitals, 
today, and I'll, be, I'll defer to you because you're there every day, but you know, the OSHA requirements oh. and the things that are getting pushed on you all, yeah. it's a big this problem. So, so I know you all have gotten sent a lot of letters and a lot of regulations, a lot of confusion. So we're, we're in the press of collecting those letters um, to push back. So I'd love to thank connect you. with you afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you. yeah, most definitely. So yeah, yeah, <coughs> manager. Yeah. Um, so I'm Rusty Barnum, the city administrator. Um, the ARP funds and the, and the, the previous bill that, that got us money. Well, I appreciate it. And it's great that we get to spend it on them. Um, I think it's creating an unsustainable um, environment for cities like ours because we've got this influx of money mm -hmm. we've got these projects that we're able to fund that are nice to have but i i'm afraid that in the next few years as people see us we're spending a half million dollars to renovate an armory and um, we're spending a lot of money we got a 10 million dollar grant for the airport uh, I, i'm afraid that this type of influx is going to cause substantial problems in the rural kansas area um, also, I'm a little troubled by the, the $1.9 trillion infrastructure bill <clears throat> because I was notified yesterday that it's not out of the question that Ellsworth will get a half million dollars for our airport, which is really only used for a couple of novel flyers and the governor flying to, to visit the prison in So I'm really concerned about the allocations with that and any subsequent bills or thank goodness the stimulus have stopped. Um, much as I enjoyed it because I got a golf cart, I personally didn't deserve it because I've got my military retirement. I work in the government. Um, and I think those things are just are poison for uh, our community and the, the country as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One thing we hear a lot about is um, a lot of concerns and frustration with the federal unemployment supplement, which kind of what you're referring to. So this was in the American Rescue Plan, which I opposed, passed in March. And it's a situation where you know people are making more money many times to stay at home than uh, to return to their job, the $300 a week. Um, that, that is set to expire next month. And so a lot of job, um, you know, business owners, small business all over the district have been really concerned and frustrated by that. There has been an effort, there's a desire by some to extend that. Um, I would strongly oppose that. So far, uh, Joe Manchin, who we mentioned earlier, he said over the weekend he would not support extending that. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, you referenced the infrastructure bill. So understand what was originally proposed, the $2 trillion infrastructure bill that was proposed, $2 trillion, biggest spending bill in the history of the country. Only 10% of, or only 5% of that, or $100 billion, only $100 billion, um, as proposed, would go towards roads and bridges. Um, $80 billion was earmarked for, or was specified for climate change research, $186 billion for electric vehicle charging stations, um, $400 billion to upfit people's homes and commercial buildings uh, to be more environmentally friendly. I mean, basically, it's taking the, the tenets of the Green New Deal, calling it infrastructure. And, and trying to ram it through. And so that's, that's what we're dealing with there. That's why I strongly oppose it. The other concerning thing for that um, is on the other side of the ledger, how that would be paid for. So the pay fors as proposed was um, increase the corporate tax by as much as 7%, increase capital gains tax um, to as high as 41%, uh, doing away with the 1031 tax deferred exchange um, and doing away with the stepped up basis, which is a really big deal. Uh, for agriculture, we have so many generational and, and small businesses. We have so many generational family farms, and the ability to pass the farm on for generation to generation with a step up in basis to either minimize or prevent estate taxes um, is a big deal. So um, I'm optimistic that we can get the uh, stepped up basis provisions killed and taken out of that legislation. But that's something that's, that's been coming up a lot, and, and that's the latest with with the infrastructure bill. Now, what the Senate just passed over the weekend or a couple of days ago was 1.2 trillion, but that's combined with the budget, which is 3.5 trillion. So it's going to be 4.7 trillion dollars. And again, we just cannot afford uh, to spend money uh, at this rate and not think there's going to be a consequence. So uh, yeah, you have a question, sir? So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. You get the nail on the head. We cannot keep spending money foolishly and frivolously. You know, what makes dogs bark? We spend trillions, of, I mean, billions of dollars on foolishness like that. Why do cats meow? Let's study the nesting habits of the osprey. That's just plain foolish. We don't have money. We can't even take care of the, money, the citizens we have in America right now. And we spend money foolishly like that. Yeah. In, Amer in the federal government, you know, they can always spend more money. Now, my dad only had a first grade education, but he was smart enough to know that you can't spend more than you take in. Mm -hmm. You can't keep doing that. 
Amen. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We're spending money we don't have on things that we don't need, which is disastrous. Uh, no, I don't think uh, I'm going to hear from some other people. Uh, yes, yes. Sir. I'm Lisa Houston. I'm retired. And one of my questions I have is um, concern over the mandating of the vaccine uh, for, you know, everybody. And then also I'm hearing that if you're not vaccinated, that, that, that those that are on Medicare and Medicaid might be dropped from that. Is there any truth to that? Where do we stand on mandating the vaccine and masking? Yeah, well, I was sort of saying I strongly oppose mandates. I mean, I just think the government's provided a vaccine. Yeah. The government's provided a vaccine, provide information to free adults who can then make the decision on what's right for them and their family. Um, so you will see me strongly oppose and fight tooth and nail any vaccine mandate, any vaccine passport, uh, any efforts like that. It's just wrong uh, for America. Big picture, we've got to acknowledge the government has grown tremendously over the last 16 months in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways. And I would contend when government grows, freedoms reduce, and, uh, and that's not good. Now, we are starting to see uh, the federal government work to try to mandate you know, certain agencies to be vaccinated. Um, that started with the VA announced I think, three weeks ago they were going to have some of their employees uh, be vaccinated. And now over the weekend, the military announced that they were going to, uh, to mandate vaccines as well. And I, just, I oppose that. That's, in, in my view, not right. Now, um, the, so far, the, the law would say and the courts have upheld that, like the, vet, like the VA I'm on the committee, when they try to um, mandate a vaccine, you can um, opt out for two reasons. One, if you have a um, letter from your doctor, you know, for medical reason, or two, you can sign an affidavit if it, it violates your, uh, if, it's, if it's against your religion, or for religious purposes, you can opt out of it. And, and that's um, held up in court um, so far. Now we will see what happens um, legislatively or, uh, or in the courts as more vaccines um, get, get forced upon. But again, you gotta be free adults, and, uh, and, and we're past time to doing that. Um, uh, I have one question for yeah. you. Um, are you familiar with this, what I've been reading online about uh, what they're proposing as far as IRA transaction fees that are supposed to be where they can take 8.5% of IRA transaction fees? Uh, and it would, could affect someone's IRA by as much as $20,000. And I'm not in favor of this for my children and grandchildren. I don't, I don't see why there should be these kind of transaction fees. I hope you'll look into this. Oh, okay. I've not heard that yet, but happy to. Yeah, happy to look it's into it. It's been in the news lately. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, because, yeah. because the COVID vaccine is, <laughs> is experimental at this point, and it, it was released on a, an emergency basis, mm -hmm. I think we need to address that essentially it's against the Nuremberg Code to to make anyone get it for any purpose, whether it's your your job or anything. I mean, that's that's human rights. That that shouldn't be taken from us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, very they're in the back. And then I'll go to you next, ma'am. Yeah, yes, sir. Yep. Um, we're, we're seeing a deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. And there's, a, there's a strong possibility that what we've been told and the reality, they're, they're not matching up. Um, there are reports that we have recall in 90 days, meaning that some very bad people are going to get a lot of our military equipment um, and fall into their hands. So we're going to be in a better position now than we were 20 years ago. What kind of briefings are you being given? What kind of knowledge do you have? Or is this all news to you too? But, um, it's not news to me because I'm following, but zero briefings, zero insider information, zero. They're really not briefing the Congress on what's happening. Um, we're reading the same news you are. Now, you know, asking questions about what's going on, but, um, but there's a uh, really concern. You know, just look at all the gains that have happened, and it's really you know, sad to see the Taliban is moving very quickly to take on. I know there's a legislation that I voted to support. Um, but basically, people, um, Af Afghani people that, like translators and people that really helped us, um, there's been efforts for them to be able to come to the United States. Otherwise, you know, they basically have a death sentence if they stay there, uh, which I supported. Um, but we're, what's unfolding you know, right now is, is very, very concerning. Yeah, to me. Um, yes, ma'am. This is just springboarding off of what Kim and others have said regarding mandates and vaccines. 
where is the logic when people are saying it's about health and we have the border crisis? Everybody come in, nobody cares what their status is. Where is the logic when they're getting joints out to persuade you to take this and they're giving you free Krispy Kreme donuts for a year to take this? Is there any logical person left in Washington? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not enough. Not, not enough. enough. Take your vitamin D and increase your immune system. Right. Yeah. Again, so the government. Yeah. No. I agree. So the government. The government's provided a vaccine and people and information. And people can decide if they want to take it. Um, yeah. And to your. I mean, you know, the board. We never talked about that yet. What. A, what a mess. Um, actually, I went down there a few weeks ago, a couple months ago. Uh, I, I led a freshman delegation. I wanted to see firsthand what's really going on. And I'll tell you, I left there both <laughs> outraged and heartbroken. Um, outraged at these horrible policies. Um, that, that um, are, are senseless and, and you know this last month alone our border crossings are up to um, almost 200,000 people um, that, that are crossing the border and understand this you go down there and learn that no one crosses the border on the Mexican side without paying off the cartels right. uh, the cartels completely control the border and you're able you know I can go and talk to people and it's pretty clear the market you know the, the, the cartels for every crossing charge at that time this is April um, three to five thousand dollars so if you just call that four thousand dollars and do the math at four thousand dollars a person uh the number of people 170,000 uh, a month uh here a month ago you know the cartels are literally making seven eight hundred million dollars a month uh under our horrible policy so the cartels are the winners but these innocent kids are the losers because looking at these kids and you realize that this is horrible policy um, not to mention the the COVID and the double standard um, with that so it is, it is um, horrific, and we've been jumping up and down about it. We've been talking to the Biden administration. We've called all. It infuriated me then when you have Vice President Harris, supposed to be in charge of it, flies over the border um, to, yeah. to go to other countries and is, is not willing. And the only place she's gone is El Paso, which really doesn't have the problem. But if you go to uh, where I was at, McAllen, Texas, and the Donna Processing Facility and look in the eyes of these kids, you know this is the wrong thing to do. And so it is outrageous and horrible. So, Any other? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Let's get our kids out of masks statewide. Yes. yes. Yeah. Amen. 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 I had to put my grandson in a mask to go to school today. And so I <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. This should be local. This a family should choose that or local. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I read today that they had passed a bill that, to not put CRT, not teach CRT in schools. <clears throat> Correct. So, yeah, well, in, in the Senate, yeah, which is a good thing. So what happened over the weekend, you know, the Senate had this marathon infrastructure um, discussion. They just think called a voterama where they have all of these votes that, that they get people on record for. And so one of the amendments to the infrastructure bill basically said that there would not be federal funds for education, right. specifically higher education, if um, critical race theory um, was part of the curriculum which is a right. you know it was a really good thing and that passed uh, that passed in the senate that, so that's an amendment that passed the senate yeah yeah so now it's not passed the house yet and it's not law but the fact that it passed the senate and they got the votes that they did is a, is a good thing so i worry a lot about you know what we're teaching our kids the direction of the country I mean, it's that's wrong. true and in elementary school junior high high school colleges mm. yes sir what concern is uh, the people that are still locked up in jail what what is being done? Why why are they still locked up since January sixth? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We've we've not gotten answers to that. So asked those questions have not gotten answers uh, to 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 what's really going on there. Different states are different, but I mean, if you're one that's locked up, you would expect the American people to come and do something. About yeah, something. but to be locked up without charges or this, at least. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. I understand. That's my concern. Yeah, today. yeah. Sure that. Anything else? Uh, yes, sir. I understand that Biden wants to uh, change the bill to put uh, uh, tax on mileage. Uh, yeah. Tax on mileage? Potentially, yeah. Okay, well, that affects me dearly. Look at that Kansas map. I've been in every county in the state. And I've traveled over one and a half many miles in the last 20 years. Is that going to affect the gas or how it's going to work? Yeah, so, so what you're referring to, so um, the, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that got released on Friday and voted on on Sunday is 2,700 pages. So I think that's 2,700 pages. So there's, you know, we're in the process of combing through it, right? But one of the provisions that was buried in it is this notion of looking at a mileage tax. And I think the intent is, you know, we have a gas tax today 
but as there's more electric vehicles, you know, they're not paying the gas tax. So my sense is that's the intent. However, my concern is, you know, in the rural areas, we drive so many more miles than, uh, you know, than, than are driven in, in, in urban areas. And so we're going to pay a disproportionate share. Now, all that was in the, that legislation, as we've seen, is um, authorizing the study of a mileage tax. Um, it did not require a mileage tax. It also did not talk about how much the mileage tax would be, but it's authorizing a study and laying the groundwork uh, for that potential discussion. And again, that was in the infrastructure bill that just passed one of 2,700 pages and, uh, um, you know, is yet to play out in the House. So a lot to come there, but that's the latest. So, so. so in the beginning of the discussion, you were heavily attacked about your voting. Would I be correct in my assumption that some of your votes that you do is because some of the other crap that they put into the bill? Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yes, sir. Back in the, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. This is a little bit of a personal and fun question. So, yeah. over the years, we've seen this polarization occur. Are there any Democrats that you might disagree with politically, but you just like them personally? You can hang out, you can have a good time, you can laugh, and then just disagree professionally. We've seen less of that. You know, it'd be nice to see more of that. Is there somebody you can just say, yep, I hang out with this guy, I don't agree with a single thing, he or she believes in, but I, but I like them. Is there yeah, yeah, there'd be a handful of people like that. Um, understand that a problem right now is that Congress isn't functioning properly, meaning, and that was true before, but now everybody's masked up. So, you know, you come in as a freshman, you're one of 400, you know, I'm trying to get 430 for other people who are in mass. Um, many of them don't come to Washington, D.C. because of COVID, you have the pro these proxy rules, which means you can just give your voting proxy to some, first time in the history of the country, you can give your proxy to someone else and they can vote for you. So understand a lot of members don't even come to Washington, D.C. right now, which is, I strongly disagree with. Um, our committee, so on the House Ag Committee, 45 members um, on the House Ag Committee. And, and so far, it's, it's, virtu it's, um, it's hybrid, right? So you can go in person or you can um, zoom in from, from your office or whatever. 45 members. I, I'm an in-person, I'm a show-up kind of a guy, so I always go to the hearings and, and, and meetings in person. Um, I had a little friendly wager with my office the other day before the meeting. Um, how many people do you think are going to be in the room when we gavel in? 45-member committee. Uh, the answer was, I won the bet, unfortunately, five. Um, so I'm just saying, when people aren't even showing up, you know, how do you have a relationship? You know, things happen by relationship. How do you have a relationship? How do you get to know people, have a relationship, and then convince them um, to maybe think differently or think how we do if they're not even showing up? So what needs to happen is the mask needs to come off, or we need to turn to regular order. Proxy voting needs to end. Committee needs to start meeting as they should. Um, that's not going to, you know, wave a wand and solve all the problems, but, but it is going to, to help. Um, you know, Congress be a little more functional, which will be a good thing. So, so. Yeah. Yes, I'm happy to stick around. Maybe one more question. I'm happy to stick around uh, and answer. Yeah, maybe last question. I'm happy to stick around for a while and answer any other questions one on one. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm born and raised on a farm. I have a lot of farmer friends, livestock men, ranchers. They're concerned and have been for several years about the price when they go to sell their cattle, their sheep, their pigs. And right now, <clears throat> they're having to sell their animals, just get out from underneath raising them. We're going to lose our Kansas farmers. What can we do? What can you do? Yeah, no, very concerned about specifically the cattle industry right now. So we're in a situation where, you know, the margins that the packers are making is this, and, and producers have put a lot more work and time into it, you know, are either losing money, barely breaking even, or making a tiny bit. Um, you know, there, there's a Department of Justice investigation right now on is there collusion or price fixing or things happening. Uh, the investigation, in my view, has gone on for way too long. Uh, we've um, repeatedly called on the Justice Department to um, wrap up the investigation or provide an update on what's going on there. Uh, but I have a lot of, yeah, a lot of concerns with what we're seeing in the cattle markets right now. Um, I would just conclude by this. I would say, you know, it's easy to uh, get gloomy, right, uh, a lot of things. But it's important that we remember we're still the United States of America. Uh, we're still the best country in the history of the world. Now, I would contend that we need to make good decisions today uh, to make sure that we remain a, a you know, the, the great country that we are. But, um, but it's not lost on me that um, the exact geographic center of the entire country is in, you know, in Smith County um, right here. So our district truly is kind of the heartbeat of the country. And, uh, and the basic values that still exist in Ellsworth County and throughout the Big First, 
um, don't exist as much as from other parts of the country, but basic values like faith, um, like caring for our neighbor, hard work, caring for your family, you know, those values are still alive and well here, and it's essential that we keep them alive and well here in the Big First, because uh, we're kind of like the pilot light for the country. And so um, I would just continue, I would just contend that it's important that we continue to believe uh, in the future of America uh, while we pray and while we work our tail off to, uh, to make sure that America is as strong as it possibly can be moving forward. So thanks for taking time.